thank you Anupam and Urna. So uh, this was uh, my talk, uh, this uh, extra lecture was arranged at the last minute, so I was wondering what I could cover. And I thought I should introduce you to some biological systems. And uh, today uh, what I will do is to give you some uh, basic ideas about uh, biological membranes. Okay. It's going to be very, very simple and uh, basic. Uh, the plan is the following. I will first uh, tell you what biological membranes are or uh, lipid membranes are. And then I will uh, talk a little bit about uh, the elasticity of these membranes and equilibrium shapes, what determines equilibrium shapes. And after that, I will uh, talk about fluctuations. And towards the end, I will give you some examples of uh, some real systems and some examples where uh, people have looked at active membranes and uh, how uh, uh, active fluctuations modify the uh, behavior of these membranes. So, um, I should first start uh, by introducing what lipid bilayer membranes are. Okay. These are form of lipid molecules, which I represent by this. Basically, it has a head, which is hydrophilic. That means that if you put this molecule in water, uh, the head group is ionic and it likes to dissolve in water. But these tails are hydrocarbon tails and these are hydrophobic. That means if you put this molecule in water, the tails don't like to dissolve in water, it's like oil, okay. So this molecule has a dilemma because uh, one part of it likes water and it wants to be in water and another part doesn't like water and does, so wants to be away from water. So if you put, put such molecules in, uh, in, in, in a, in a uh, uh, beaker of water, what happens is they self-organize, okay. The reason they self-organize and they self-organize and they form some sort of aggregates. And the reason they aggregate is that of course, it goes against entropy because to maximize entropy, you want the molecules to be free and not form aggregates. But there is also some sort of interactions by which the, uh, these tails want to come together and uh, be away from water, okay. So um, I will not go into the, into the, uh, the process of self-assembly. Self this is uh, an interesting process. But in the end, what you get is these molecules will form layers like that. These are like sheets, okay. Uh, depending on the type of molecules, you can get other structures. For example, if you have a single tail, then uh, it likes to form what are called micelles, like that, okay. So this outside is water. And uh, here, because there are two tails, these molecules are more like cylinders, like if you come in, if, if you, uh, rotate them about that axis, they are more like cylinders and they like to form these sheets and not micelles, okay. The other difference between this kind of a system and this system is that because there are two tails, the hydrophobicity is very strong, okay. So the tendency to come together is very strong. Because of that reason that there are not, no exchanges of the molecules between this bilayer and the bulk, okay. In this system, in this system there are free monomers. And these free monomers can exchange between, uh, between these micelles, okay. So at equilibrium, uh, these molecules, uh, the numbers are fluctuating here, okay. But in this case, because there are two tails and the molecule is very strongly hydrophobic, these, uh, there, there, is, there is hardly, the concentration in the bulk is very, very, very low and these numbers remain uh, conserved, okay. And this is very important for what I'm going to cover. So if I have a closed system, like for example, a membrane, uh, bag, okay, closed uh, uh, bag, and then uh, the number of molecules on the surface or number of molecules on this membrane is to be, uh, is conserved, okay. So there are certain, um, okay, so these molecules are arranged like this, and so one of the interaction is a hydrophobic interaction, which is what is keeping them together, but there is also steric repulsion. So in the end, you have You have a minimum and you have a preferred distance 
between molecules. Okay? So this is the second important fact. First is that these molecules like to be confined to this bilayer. And second is that these molecules have a preferred uh, distance with, between each other. However, the ordering within the membrane, at least in the case of biological membrane, is fluid-like. Okay? Uh, in pure systems, you can have gel-like ordering and crystal-like ordering. But in, in biological systems, it's always fluid-like. Okay? That means these lipid molecules are free to diffuse in the 2D plane of the membrane. Okay? So you might think that, okay, if these molecules can, are free to diffuse in the 2D plane, uh, this membrane should also have a interfacial tension, like a drop of liquid or a, like a soap bubble. Right? However, it turns out that because these molecules like to be at this equilibrium distance, the, if you calculate the, inter, the, the interfacial tension, which is A is the area of the membrane. Let's say I have this, uh, this closed bag, okay? And A0 is the preferred area. That is, all the molecules that are at the, are the, are the preferred distance from each other. Then this interfacial tension is zero, okay? So there's no interfacial energy, okay? Uh, that means that this membrane, if I, whatever the shape it has, it doesn't try to minimize its surface area. Okay, like unlike a soap bubble, for example. Okay, in the case of soap bubble, what happens is soap is made of surfactant molecules. So these molecules can, I have a bubble of soap like that, and these molecules which are in the surface can go into the bulk. Okay, thereby the number of molecules on the surface can always adjust in order to keep it minimum. But in this case, this is not possible. Okay, which means the surface, the interfacial uh, uh, energy is uh, zero unless you try to deform it. For example, I could, uh, I could stretch this membrane or I could compress this membrane. Then I am taking the molecules away from this uh, preferred uh, uh, distance and then it costs uh, energy. Okay. So I can write, so uh, I can also write an elastic term for this compression or uh, dilation, which I just mentioned. And Okay, uh, in the case of soap film, if I expand this, okay, that's my soap film. This is uh, air, that's A, okay. And I have these molecules sitting like that at the surface because remember, these molecules, the head group likes water, the tail doesn't like water. So one, the option to avoid water at the surface is to do this, okay. So I have two layers of these and I have water here. And I have also micelles here. Okay. Now, this system has an interface and it can minimize its interface by pushing more and more molecules from the bulk into the, uh, sorry, from the surface into the bulk and forming micelles. Okay. Whereas in this case, you can't do that because the solubility is very, very low. Is it clear or not? Exactly. Here, the number, number of molecules on the surface is not conserved. You can have exchange of uh, particles between the surface and the bulk. Okay. So the, the molecules on the surface can go and form micelles into the bulk. Okay. Whereas here, because the solubility is very low, this doesn't happen. They're clear on. And this is very important for biological membranes because a creature like amoeba lives in water. And it doesn't want, uh, when the external uh, concentration of the lipid molecules is very, very low or almost zero, it doesn't want the membrane to disintegrate by lipid molecules leaving the surface. Right? So you cannot make these kind of membranes out of surfactant molecules with just one tail. You need lipids, which have two tails. Okay. There, are, there are many other consequences of this uh, between, the, uh, uh, which, which leads to differences between a soap film and uh, and membranes, but uh, today I will not be able to discuss it, but we can discuss it later if you want. Okay, so I can write a surface free energy expression, which is some kappa s, okay. So this is one of the contributions to the elasticity, because if I take this membrane and if I apply a force and if I try to stretch it, 
or I inject more volume into this bag and try to stretch it, try to expand it, it costs energy because I'm taking these molecules away from the preferred uh, uh, equilibrium spacing. So I can consider many different cases. For example, let's say I have a vesicle uh, whose volume is some, uh, volume is equal to just, the, the membrane is, let's say, not stretched at all, okay? So the radius is that of a sphere where the membrane is not stretched at all. Now if I sort of reduce this volume, so I take V less than V0, that is I take some volume out of the vesicle, like put a syringe and suck some water out, then what I get is a floppy vesicle, okay? And not a smaller tense vesicle, okay? Which is what, which, which, which is what happen if I have a soap bubble, okay? I could do the other thing, I could increase the volume okay, by injecting uh, volume into the uh, vesicle, then the membrane is going to stretch okay, because I am changing the uh, area per molecule. Okay. And then I, I have to pay this elastic energy cost. Okay. This is per unit area, uh, so I have, to, I have to pay this energy cost. Okay. So this is not only the only uh, elasticity which the membrane has. By the way, the thickness of this membrane is about 40 angstrom, typically. Okay. And because it has a finite thickness, it also costs energy to bend this membrane. Okay. You can easily imagine that if I try this, to take this membrane and I try to bend it, I am stretching the outer leaflet and I am compressing the inner leaflet. Okay. And this costs energy. So I should also have an energy cost for bending. Some which depends on the curvature, okay? Um, and be, be, because it's a symmetric membrane, bending it this way or that way is the same. So I have a, the, the lowest term I can write is something in C square, okay? But this curvature of the membrane can be decomposed into, uh, into two principal curvatures. So if I have a, let's say I have a sheet like that. I can define two curvatures in the orthogonal direction. Let's say this is the radius of curvature in one direction. This is the radius of curvature in the orthogonal direction. Then I have two principal curve, two, two uh, ortho curvatures in the orthogonal direction. And I can define two different curvatures. I can define a mean curvature. Okay. And I can define a Gaussian curvature. I think I've used the word C. Okay, this is so this is the average okay, by two. Okay. And these are the two, two uh, principal curvatures which are possible for this membrane. I say principal curvature because these are two, these are independent, okay? I could, yeah? Here, uh, no. Okay, so um, for example, if I take a flat surface, obviously all the curvatures are zero, okay? I can take a cylinder, in this case, I have a mean curvature which is not, not zero, but this curvature is zero, so I have Gaussian curvature zero. Okay. Or I can have a sphere, and in this case, I have both non zero. And the other shape I can consider is a saddle, okay? And if I take the case, so this is minus and this is positive. So uh, if I take the case where the magnitude are the same, then I can, I can have the condition, okay? So these are various possibilities. Um, 
Ah, CG is not zero. Sorry. So now I can write down this free energy expression. I know. In this, uh, we are we are we are we are only considering the cases where like the membrane is thin enough that uh, there is no coupling between the bending and the stretching. These are two independent deformations. So I have, I can write the free energy expression. This is called the Helfrich per unit area of the curvature free energy. I'm, this is for bending. Okay. Here I, I introduced, apart from the mean curvature, square of the mean curvature, I introduced a term C naught just to allow for spontaneous curvature. Okay. For example, if I have um, in this system, like in this bilayer, If I introduce molecules which have some asymmetry, for example, some molecules which are like that, okay, it could be some proteins. Then if I introduce them on one of the leaflets, then these, these molecules prefer a curvature, okay. It likes, it likes the membrane to be bent like that. So the ground state of the membrane is no longer a flat membrane, but it's a curved membrane. So that's why I've introduced this uh, C0. So now I have to, the tot for the total free energy, I have to add these two terms together. And yeah, so, um, okay, I will, I will, I will, I will come to a moment, you may say that this is not stable then, okay, because this could be negative. But I'll come, in a moment I'll tell you that uh, for, we are, most of the time in, in, in biological systems, you're considering only closed, closed uh, uh, membranes. And for closed membranes, the Gaussian curvature is a constant, it's invariant uh, uh, when shape changes, okay. So maybe I just uh, discuss that. Uh, yeah. Okay, so there is there is something called Gauss Bonnet theorem. Okay, which says that where G is the genus of the object. Okay, so depending on number of holes, then uh, uh, this uh, this quantity remains constant. Okay. So if I add sphere, then I get uh, four pi, uh, and uh, it doesn't change even if I go from a sphere to some kind of a floppy uh, shape. Okay, for this reason, when you when you do the minimization, this can be ignored. Okay, so that's why I'm not worrying about this uh, issue. Right. But, but for these membranes, typically they don't break easily. The reason is that when you want to break, then you have to go through a large energy barrier because uh, for a, for a, for a uh, short time, you are exposing the lipid uh, tails to the, to the water outside, okay? So this is a large enough barrier that uh, unless you do something extra to aid it, like supply some energy or something, they don't spontaneously break. So the happens. It happens, but in these cases, what happens is there are other proteins which come in and aid this process. For example, in the case of cell division, there are actin filaments which assemble, and there is uh, there is active contraction of these uh, actin filaments, and this helps in the breaking. 
or uh, in, 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 in the case of budding, for example, there are uh, proteins called dynamin, which can come and squeeze the membrane and uh, aid in the breaking of the membrane. Yeah. Locally, you can have, absolutely, absolutely. So when you do the minimization for shape, when you want to calculate shape, you're integrating over the entire surface, and then you don't have to worry about it. Maybe I should keep some of these sheets here. So you have these stupid questions. Yeah, please. This membrane, does it have active processes in it? At the moment, I'm not considering active processes, okay? I will, in a moment towards the end, I will, uh, I will take examples where uh, there can be pumps on the membrane, and then these membrane can have active processes. Okay. You see it exactly. That's that's a point which I will make towards the end of the talk. Okay. Must be having one more sheet somewhere. Okay, drop the sheet. Okay, doesn't matter. So uh, so now I can write the total energy which is uh, the sum of uh, the surface part, uh, the, the, sorry, the stretching part and the bending part. And you can do, do a variation and you can, so the total energy, So I allow for a change in volume because I am considering closed uh, uh, vesicles uh, here. As I already, this term I am neglecting, so I am not worrying about that. Okay, And then you have to minimize this in order to get the shapes. So if you do that, uh, I have included here, okay? The sigma is uh, the tension which is coming from that, okay? So the sigma I could say is something like uh, some constant into, okay, at the molecular level stretching. Okay, this I can. Delta P is the change in pressure. Okay, because if I have closed vesicle in, 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 in general, if I have tension on the membrane because of stretching, then the pressure is not the same as the pressure outside. Okay. If you do this, you see that you can get uh, interesting shapes. For example, uh, okay, so I, so what am I considering? I am considering a vesicle. Okay. V0 is the volume where the membrane is not stretched. It's, it's sphere, but the membrane is not stretched. Membrane is under zero, stre zero stretch, okay? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the shapes as a function of V by V0, okay? Reduce volume, okay? What are the equilibrium shapes that are possible, okay? If I do, do this, then the shapes which I get are the following. This is for, okay, the volume is very low. Okay, surface area is the same. Uh, if I then increase the volume a little bit, I get a shape like that. And then if I increase the volume a little bit, I get a transition. I get a discontinuous transition to a different shape. Okay, these are all shapes which have an axis of symmetry about that, okay? So you can rotate it uh, about this point, okay? So this also has an axis of symmetry. And then if I again increase the volume, I get something like that. So this is, uh, these are numbers uh, obtained from some calculations. And then you again get a discontinuous transition where the preferred shape is oriented like that, 
Okay, so now the axis of symmetry is this. Okay, and then if I, um, this is like a red blood cell shape. Okay, this is like a biconcave disc. No, uh, here I am rotating about this axis. Okay, here I am rotating about uh, about this axis. So these are two different shapes. And then finally, I get a ellipse, and then at uh, uh, the reduce volume equal to one, I get a sphere. Okay. So the uh, so these are the here we, I've taken sigma equal to zero. Okay, because I'm I'm not stretching the membrane because the v is always less than v zero or equal to v zero. V by V0 is changing. So what I have here with the minimization is that I have the bending energy, okay, and I change the volume, and I'm calculating shapes by minimizing the bending energy cost. So only bending energy. And no, only stretching no stretching. Okay. C not also I'm keeping zero here. Okay, so I should have mentioned these two things. So this is uh, sigma equal to zero and C not equal to zero. Uh, this kappa is non-zero. Yeah, yeah, stretching energy is zero. Yeah. So, uh, so what I'm, I'll repeat this. So I'm taking a vesicle, which is, which has a volume, which is such that uh, the vesicle is spherical, but the membrane is not stretched. Is that clear or confusing? Sorry, all of them have same area. Yeah, so let me, so I take this membrane, I already said that if I, if I try to make a vesicle and if I try to put more, more volume into it, it, there comes a time when it becomes spherical and then if I put even more volume, it starts stretching, right? Because the area per molecule is changing, right? So I am, the, the starting point in this is a volume where it is, it has just become a sphere, okay? The membrane is not under tension. Okay. The number of molecules on the membrane is conserved. The membrane is not under tension. And from this state, what I'm doing is to take volume out of the system and ask what are the equilibrium shapes. Is that clear or not? Yeah. Now you might ask that, okay, why do I get a shape like this? Because if I want to reduce bending energy, I would have preferred a shape like that, a closed shape, which is rotated about that axis. Right? A disk, okay, enclosing some volume, uh, some volume which is like, you know, 0 0.05, the reduced volume. This doesn't have, this, this shape, which is curved, is preferred over this for the simple reason that for this shape, I have a high curvature area at these two edges. Okay? So when I integrate it around this entire disk, this contribution to energy becomes very high because here the curvature is very high. Is it clear or not? Whereas here, what I have done is that I have minimized this uh, high curvature edge by allowing some smaller uh, curvature bend. Is that okay? Okay. So that is why this shape is pre pre preferred over this one. Okay. When I, when I integrate the curvature energy, uh, this has a lower energy compared to that. Okay. This is because the curvature goes, curvature energy goes as one by R square. So it doesn't like, it doesn't like, you know, uh, very uh, high curvature regions. It tries to minimize the high curvature regions. What is this curvature the curvature Because of what I said earlier, because if I try to bend this membrane, I am stretching this leaflet and I'm compressing this leaflet. Okay, so I'm changing the area per molecule away from this equilibrium uh, uh, condition. It's a mean curvature. It's a mean curvature. Sorry? Uh, which is for one, two, three, four, and for these two, okay, this shape it's rotated about this axis. Okay, this is an axis of symmetry. Okay, so it's like a it's like a disc, 
where the two faces of the disc have a concave shape. Okay. This one is more like a dumbbell. Okay. It is rotated about this axis. Okay. So, these two are complete different shapes and uh, there are these dis discontinuous transitions between them. Okay. Okay, so that is about uh, shape. Now I come to fluctuations. Okay, so I think I have some. Uh, okay, I'll maybe come to that. Maybe I'll, let me just show that. I had some uh, images to show. Um, okay, so this is a uh, simulation of these lipid bilayer membranes, just to give a feeling of uh, you know how this membrane looks like. So these are the lipid molecules. The head groups are towards the outside. The tails are towards the inside, and uh, they are undergoing this uh, uh, this jiggling around because of thermal fluctuations. And if you this this uh, simulation is looping. If you wait long enough, you will see that these molecules are diffusing around. So, in the in the in the dimension of the plane, in the dimension of the, in the plane of the membrane, uh, this is a fluid. Okay. Um, and uh, you can in in real biological membrane, it is not just lipids which is present. There is also cholesterol, which are these yellow things which have been shown in between. And cholesterol plays a very important role because it maintains the fluidity of the membrane. Okay. You need a certain amount of cholesterol to make sure that these membranes do not freeze at a lower temperature and become uh, more uh, uh, gel like or solid like. Yeah. Is there channels? I have not come to it, I will come to it later. These are okay. So, right now, right now I am just considering a pure lipid bilayer. Okay. In biological systems, you have large, first of all, you have a large variety of lipids, lipids with different tail lengths and so on. You also have a large number of proteins, transmembrane proteins, okay. Like Christian mentioned uh, ion channels, for example. These are proteins which span the membrane, okay. I will come to it towards the end. And uh, you can get also shapes like this. This is a shape which is called plumber's nightmare. And this is formed by uh, uh, membranes which prefer a very high Gaussian curvature. Why would it prefer a very high Gaussian curvature? Suppose imagine you have molecules like this. In one cross section they look like that. In the other cross section they look like that. So, these are wedge like molecules. Okay. If you put them uh, on the surface, they can orient in such a way that they generate Gaussian curvature. They spontaneously generate Gaussian curvature. Okay. And this shape is full of Gaussian curvature. And you can see that it is a continuous shape, this is called a bicontinuous shape, because if you live, if you are an ant living on the outer surface of this shape, you are always on the outer surface, and if you are in the inner surface of the shape, you are always in the inner surface. Okay. So, you can get uh, structures like this. You can also get uh, this sort of uh, scenarios. These are beautiful pictures taken by um, uh, the membrane physics group in Memphis, in Denmark. What they have done is they have made multi component membranes. Okay. And when you make multi component membranes, these comp different components can phase separate. Okay. And they can form domains, just like uh, you know, phase separation in, 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 in bulk. And when they phase separate and become domains, and if some of the one of the domain, let us say, have a preference for spontaneous curvature, having a non zero spontaneous curvature, it can form buds. And you can see here that you know, these, these regions have. Uh, uh, a higher curvature than the rest of the uh, sphere, the average sphere. And this is because these red regions uh, prefer, a, they, they have a spontaneous curvature and they want a larger curvature than what the sphere has. So they occur in biological Sorry? They occur in living systems. They occur in living systems also. So, I will uh, also, I do not know how much time I will have, but uh, this is one way you get buds, okay, because in cells, the cells need to exchange material between the outside and the inside. And the way one of the ways it happens is that membrane it forms membrane buds, and these buds break and it releases material to the outside. And uh, there are two mechanisms for forming these buds. One is that you you have proteins which accumulate, 
and these proteins have high spontaneous curvature and therefore it prefers the formation of bud. A second mechanism is that when you have these domains, there is also a line tension at the boundary, okay? Because you have now two component A and component B which are space separated. And this line tension, it, so you can write a line energy, okay? And the, if the system wants to minimize this line energy, it, it prefers to form these buds, okay? If there is time, I'll come to these things uh, towards the end. Yeah, right, so, so the line which I'm drawing here, each line I'm drawing here is a bilayer, okay? It's not like, this is not like a thick bilayer. You, you see what I mean? So if I just take this and if I expand this, Right. Then how are these oriented? Uh, I mean, so these molecules are oriented, uh, the, the orientation is normal to the surface. So, so are the tails uh, going into the body of the sphere or? Yes. So, so, if, so this, for example, this is a V equal to V naught case. Yeah. In this case, if I take the small region and expand. be like that, okay? So there is, no, there is no tilt for the orientation, okay? You can have also systems which prefer a tilt with respect to the layer normal. But uh, in these cases, it's always, uh, the orientation is along the layer normal. Okay, so now we come to fluctuations of these membranes. So uh, what we consider is, uh, let's consider a sheet of this membrane, okay? Okay, of size L by L. Now I can parameterize the fluctuation of this sheet by some height function, okay? Okay, so this is the Monge gauge. And this works for us because we are only considering small fluctuations and we are not considering things like overhangs and so on, okay? If you have overhangs, for example, your regions where the membrane is like bending over like that, then this is not a good parameterization to do. But for small fluctuations, this will work. And then I can write the free energy expression for the curvature Again, we are not considering a stretching at this moment, okay? We are only, uh, we are considering a membrane where uh, sigma is equal to zero. Okay, uh, let me not, uh, let me not do that. Let me write the general case where sigma cannot, can also be non-zero. So this is a base plane. where this is a Laplacian operator, okay? This uh, you can uh, uh, derive from simple uh, um, uh, differential geometry. So this is the curvature of the membrane and this is the area change in the membrane, okay? Now what one could do is one could Fourier transform this, go to Fourier space, And I can calculate these two quantities, okay? If I do that, what I will get is
So I can now write it in terms of the amplitude of each mode. So you can see that the Q dependence for the bending uh, part is different from the Q dependent for the stretching part, okay. So I get a crossover Q kappa below which uh, tension makes the main contribution and above which bending makes the main contribution, okay. This is easy to understand because if I have very high frequency undulation, this has lot of curvature, okay. So the bending energy becomes very high because I remember bending energy goes as 1 over R square, okay. So for uh, large Q, uh, the, the, the fluctuations are suppressed by the bending modulus. Now this is the, okay. Now these modes are, we can, we can consider these modes to be harmonic which means then I can write okay. I can equate each mode to uh, use equipartition and equate each mode to KB, KBT. Okay. So from this I can calculate what is the amplitude of each mode provided I know kappa and sigma. Is it okay or not? Okay. And this is useful because uh, I can now use this in order to determine these quantities. Okay. I will come to a moment how I can do that. Uh, first let us just estimate the, uh, the typical amplitude and the typical amplitude uh, if I sum over all this for example I Okay, I sum over all the amplitudes and average, then I get, uh, I get, uh, okay. of the order of L by 100, okay. So about 1 percent, okay, that is the amplitude, typical amplitude of fluctuation. And this amplitude, if I have a vesicle which is about 100 micrometers in size, Okay. These fluctuations are of the order of 1 micron, okay, and this, this, these fluctuations are then visible under a microscope, okay. So that is the, I would like to show a video recording of these vesicles. These are purely thermal fluctuations. Purely thermal fluctuations. No, so in this treatment the diffusion inside the layer is not changing the bending, bending modulus or the tension in any way, okay, because you are averaging over those fluctuations, okay. You could also say that there are density fluctuations within the, within the layer, okay. So we are, we are averaging over those fluctuations. So if you carefully watch you can see that the shape is not constant the shape is fluctuating, right. So now I can take this shape, if I do, if I'm doing an experiment and if I am interested in make, in, in finding sigma, so finding the bending modulus for example, I can take a vesicle where it is below the swelling regime so that tension is 0 and I can record these fluctuations. I can decompose these fluctuations for example. Okay, and I can plot r of theta as a function of theta and I get a height function. I can Fourier, trans Fourier uh, decompose this and I can uh, fit it to this, this model and I can get kappa out of it. So just by observing the fluctuation of the vesicle, thermal fluctuation of the vesicle, I can determine what is the bending modulus. 
Okay, it's a very powerful technique because otherwise, how do you how do you do elasticity? You have a material, you have to stretch it with something, you have to bend it with something, and you can ask what is the force required to deform it by a certain amount. Right? Here, you don't need to do anything. All you need to do is to just look at the vesicle under a microscope and just uh, analyze the shape. Okay. Um, It also means one more thing, because now if you're familiar with the polymer physics, you will immediately realize that because the system likes to explore as many conformations as possible, it also has entropic elasticity, okay? So in polymers, if you, So I have a polymer like that and let's say I grab hold of the two ends of the polymer and I try to pull this polymer by applying a force, okay? Okay, let me use small f, okay? Now I'll see that I need, there is, there is, a, there is a restoring force on the polymer purely coming out of entropy of the polymer. Okay, because the, when, I, when I change the end to end distance, what, is, what I'm doing is I am reducing the number of conformations this polymer can explore, okay? And uh, so this costs an energy, and this is called the entropic elasticity of the polymer, okay? A simple way to sort of uh, ask what is the microscopic reason for this, maybe, I mean, you can sort of tell me if this is a reasonable way of saying or not. Uh, if I apply a force, and stretch the polymer, what is happening to the polymer? This polymer is in a, in a liquid medium, okay? That means the water molecules are constantly bombarding against this polymer, okay? That is where the, the fluctuations come from, okay? Now, in this kind of a geometry, you will see that no matter in what directions the microscopic collisions occur, these collisions always try to maximize the, conform the, 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 the conf conformations the polymer can explore. Okay. In other words, these collisions always try to pull these two ends together. Okay. But the way you calculate it is you just calculate the entropy of this. You, you, look, you calculate the number of conformations that the polymer can take. And from that you can, you can show that uh, there is a, there is a uh, this polymer uh, behaves like a linear spring for very small deformations. In biology, there are also polymers which are called semi-flexible polymers. Semi-flexible polymers. Okay, these are like actin filaments for example. Okay. These are polymers which when they, when you put it in um, like water, they have undulations because of thermal fluctuations but these undulations are not as large as a uh, freely jointed polymer, okay? Because they have a bending modulus. It costs energy to bend this, okay? These are stiff polymers compared to uh, freely jointed chain. So, uh, so these polymers also will have fluctuations and this model which I described here for membrane, I can take the exact model for a polymer where I, the bending energy for the membrane becomes the bending energy for the, uh, for the polymer. Okay, so it holds the same. So here again, I can, just by looking at the fluctuation, I can calculate what is the bending modulus of the polymer. So you don't have entropic aspects in the, in the membrane uh, potential? I mean, this is the, by the stretching and the bending. So uh, this is just stretching and bending. No okay, no entropic effect. But, but if you, when you calculate the, uh, but I can calculate, if I, if I have a floppy membrane, okay, then I can calculate the conformations the membrane can explore. Okay, and so there is an entropic part coming from there. In the free, no, it's not included in the free energy expression which I uh, which I wrote here. Okay. So if I do that, I get I just write down this expression. I get an entropic tension, which goes as d is the thickness of the membrane.
delta A by A is the area strain, okay. And if I plot this, people have measured this uh, alpha is this area strain, okay. So, okay. So, I get an exponential part coming from the entropic elasticity where I am pulling out the fluctuations on the membrane. And once I have pulled out all the fluctuations of the membrane, if I try to stretch it more, then I am changing the area per molecule, okay. And that is the enthalpic part, okay. I hope that is clear. So initially I have a floppy membrane and let us say I am put, putting volume into this. Initially I am not stretching the area of the membrane. All I am doing is I am suppressing fluctuations, okay. The number of conformations the membrane can explore is becoming less and less. Beyond some point, when the, when this has just become a sphere, if I try to put more volume, I am actually stretching the membrane, okay. That is why the, you get this crossover. And you get the same thing in, uh, in the case of semi-flexible polymer, okay. So. Okay, so uh, the two things I want to uh, tell before I conclude. One is, uh, there was a question about budding. So, uh, let us consider a membrane which is composed of two, two types of lipid molecules. I have a mixture, okay. And let us say at a, as a function of some parameter like temperature for example, these, this mixture I like to uh, phase separate, okay. Then what I get is I have a mixed system which phase separates and forms domains, okay. Uh, like you saw in the images which I showed, right. Now I can ask the question, what is the stability of this membrane? when it forms these domains, okay. Will it remain flat or will it prefer some other shape? And what happens is that if I look at this from above, let us say this is, uh, uh, if I look at it from above, so that will be, then I have these domains and at the interfaces of this domain, I have a line tension. Okay, that's a line energy because the system wants to minimize the interface, okay, just like oil in water. So this likes to maintain a spherical interface, sorry, a, a circular interface, okay. And there's an interfacial energy cost. If my membrane is forced to live in the plane of this blackboard, that's all that will happen, okay. It will have this, uh, it will form these domains. These domains will diffuse around because of thermal fluctuations. And at some point they will meet each other and they will coalesce. And if I wait long enough, at the end of the day, I will get one large domain of let us say this, this is component B and this is component A. I will get one large component of the minority species, in this case let us say B in A, okay. Exactly like oil and water. But in the case of membrane, that is not what happens because I have the freedom for these domains to in principle escape into the third dimension. Okay, by changing shape. So what happens is, the system in principle could do this in order to reduce the line tension, okay, or the line energy. The line energy is some, uh, let's some Okay. But it is doing this at the expense of bending, okay. So now you can ask under what condition is it favorable to form these buds and not remain flat, okay. And you can see that the bending energy 
is the, the, the bending, uh, total bending energy is scale invariant because if I take a sphere and if I calculate the mean curvature of a sphere, this total value does not depend on the radius of the sphere, okay? Because as I make the sphere larger and larger, the curvature becomes smaller and smaller, but I'm integrating over a larger area, okay? So these two things scale in such a way that the mean curvature is scale invariant, okay? So for small, small domains, if the domain size is very small, it is not favorable to form buds because the curvature energy is, give, is very large and the line energy which I gain by doing this is very small, okay? So I get a critical area, so some SC, this is the area, domain area, okay? This is the area of this orange part. This is the line tension, so. Okay. So if the domains are very small, then the system prefers to have flat uh, surface, but the moment the phase separated domains coalesce and become larger than a critical size, it buds, it spontaneously buds. Is it clear or not? So this is the mechanism by, one of the mechanisms by which you can form buds, okay? These buds do not separate, like somebody asked, because there is a uh, barrier for breaking the membrane, and this is where in biological membranes you need some other mechanisms, some other proteins which come at the, to the neck of the bud and, and sort of pinches it off, okay? But this, the bud formation itself doesn't require anything else, it just requires uh, uh, microphase separation, okay? Okay, so there are different mechanisms. Uh, Ranjani also asked what happens if, uh, if I have proteins in the membrane. So one mechanism is just like uh, phase separation in, in, in liquids, you change the temperature. Okay, you reduce the temperature below some, uh, some uh, TC that, and the... That is not typical in biology. That is not typical in biology. In biology what happens more often is that I have this lipid bilayer membrane And let's say I have a protein which is sitting here, okay? This protein is sitting here because the protein has a hydrophobic region which it wants to, uh, you know, hide from water, okay? So let's say this part of the protein is hydrophobic and the rest of it is hydrophilic, okay? Now it is often possible that the hydrophobic region of the protein is not of the exact thickness as that of the membrane. Okay, so what happens is that the membrane has to undergo some deformation. So let me just redraw this. For sake of time, I'm just drawing a few of these things. So the membrane has to deform, okay, in order to match these hydrophobicities. And same happens on this side. Now imagine I have another protein sitting here. Sorry, let me use the same color. Okay, this also causes a deformation of the membrane. Okay. Now there's an interaction between these proteins mediated by this deformation field. Okay, I can reduce this deformation field if these two proteins come together. Okay, you can just see it from the pictures. So there's an attraction between these proteins. Okay, so when you have these proteins sitting in the membrane, often depending on the for example, in this case, the hydrophobicity, the, hydro, the, the thickness of the hydrophobic region of the protein, these proteins spontaneously come together and aggregate. Now I can form domains, okay? Now I could get budding because of this reason, uh, because if the system wants to minimize the line tension, or I could get, get also budding if this protein has some, uh, you know, spontaneous curvature, okay? This protein could be, instead of like this, this protein shape could be like a wedge. In which case the protein prefers a membrane which has a curvature like that, okay? Or pr the protein induces a curvature like that, okay? So these are mechanisms by which uh, uh, you can get aggregation, okay? 
Okay, so uh, let me just see what else I have here. So uh, what we study are, uh, we look at axons, okay, axons are these tube-like structures of neuronal cells and we look at instabilities in these membranes and here is an example like for example what you see here in this video is a, is a segment of an axon and what we have done is to change the osmotic conditions such that the axon swells in volume. Axon is a membrane. So it's, the axon is a tube which is which on the outside you have a membrane, a lipid bilayer membrane and inside you have these biopolymers, actin and so on, okay. And here what we have done is to change the osmolarity of the medium such that water flows from the outside to the inside of the axon, okay, because it's a, the membrane is a semi-permeable membrane. And when you do that, this is what you see. You see, you get an instability, okay, the tube goes to some sort of peristal develops a peristaltic mode and then it goes back to a cylinder, okay. The reason for this is pretty much like the Rayleigh instability for those who are familiar with Rayleigh ins instability because if you have a cylinder of uh, fluid, the cylinder of fluid has interfacial tension and the system wants to minimize the interfacial area and one way to reduce the interfacial area to, is to go to this peristaltic mode which eventually will break into a series of droplets, okay. This is the reason when you, when you look at the spider web on a rainy day, you will see droplets which are equidistantly spaced, okay. It's because of this kind of a Rayleigh breakup. In this case, you don't get breakup because the membrane is a continuous membrane and to break the membrane, it, there's a huge energy penalty to pay for the reasons I mentioned earlier because you have to expose hydrophobic tail. So the system never breaks up into series of drop but it develops these sort of uh, modes, okay. So this is to show that in a real system with this membrane, can have behaviors which are, uh, you know, which come straight out of the simple physics which, uh, which we described. Uh, now you can ask what about if I consider non-equilibrium uh, processes. I will just introduce you to two papers in, in the next couple of minutes if that is okay and then I will stop there. So this is the paper by this group from uh, Institute Curie. And what they have done is they have taken a vesicle, there's no picture of the vesicle here, but what they have done is they've taken a vesicle, okay, and they have put pumps on this vesicle, okay. Okay, what are these pumps? These pumps can pump ions from inside, let's say inside to the outside of the Okay. So these are little, uh, little machines if you like which consume energy in the form of ATP and push ions against their concentration gradient and when they do that, they give a, uh, a kick to the membrane, okay. The membrane experiences a force, okay. Now this is a dissipative system because it's constantly consuming energy, it's dissipating energy. So uh, this membrane now is no longer a, uh, just a thermal uh, membrane undergoing thermal fluctuations, it has an active fluctuation component involved in it. And what they measure, exactly using the method I described earlier, they measure this quantity, okay, uh, logarithm of tension versus the reduced uh, uh, area strain or the area strain. And you see that in the passive case, when you compare the passive case and the active case, that is a case where these membranes are active and the membranes are not active then you see that in the active case there is a softening of this uh, tension, okay, which comes from this active fluctuations uh, the membrane is experiencing. And there is a paper where uh, people like Sriram and uh, others have tried to model this and in their case what they consider is a case like this where they, these pumps also have an asymmetry, okay. Because of the asymmetry, the pumps have a preferred curvature. Okay, so if I create a positive curvature, pumps with an asymmetry of that type will try to go and accumulate at the region of positive curvature. And if I have a negative curvature, pumps of this type will go and accumulate at the region of negative curvature. And what they show is again they derive these conditions uh, and here, uh, 
here you can see that uh, they have an expression for this, uh, the, the amplitude of the different modes. And here now the kappa gets renormalized and you have a kappa effective coming from the active uh, fluctuations of the membrane. They map okay. it on an equilibrium system. Sorry? They map their model on an equilibrium system. Exactly. Okay. So in these simple cases, they have, in the first case, they just assume an effective temperature. And so then the fluctuations get scaled by this effective, effective temperature. Okay. So activity is just uh, assumed. It need not always be like that. Okay. So synthetic is a uh, The experiment is on synthetic uh, membrane. But the experiment is motivated by red blood cells. Okay, the peep, by red blood fluctuations of red blood cells. So, so there are what people have shown is that if you look at the fluctuation spectrum of a red blood cell, if you do, if you measure it with ATP and in the absence of ATP, these spectra are very different. People do not know the details of what exactly is uh, the are the active processes inside. Okay, uh, but they know that there are uh, active processes which leads to a change in the fluctuation spectrum. Okay. There have been different uh, papers which suggest what could be the active processes. There are some papers which suggest molecular motor activity and so on. Okay, so what is also interesting is apart from modifying the fluctuation spectrum, you could also get instabilities. So in this case, what is happening is that the pumps are pumping Okay, so the pumps generate a curvature because they are pumping and once they generate a curvature, there is a tendency for the pumps to uh, aggregate. They aggregate because they have a preferred curvature. Okay, when they aggregate, the pumps even stronger. Okay, so the curvature increases and then more pumps come and aggregate. So you get a unstable situation where this membrane protrusion just grows. Okay. So you can get this kind of instabilities, which you don't get in, uh, in, in purely passive systems. Okay. So if anybody is interested, I can give the references to these papers if you want to look at it in more detail. Speak about instability, it's not that something which is not possible in equilibrium now becomes possible exactly. in a stable way, but the new stable regimes. Right, uh, but. Uh, speak about instability, but. Yeah, but because in this case, it's instability in the case that amplitude grows. Okay. Know that something becomes stable which was no. Stable before. no. There's no stabilization. Right. Okay. Unless there is some other factor which stabilizes it, like for example tension or something. Okay, I think with that I stop here. Uh, if there are any questions, I can uh, take them. <laughs>